Bonjour, bonjour tout le monde. Euh, je m'appelle Fanny Tan, je suis journaliste techno et j'ai l'honneur de vous présenter cette conférence euh, qui s'appelle « Keep Ukraine Online », donc « Garder l'Ukraine en ligne ». Elle est présentée par M. Dimitri Vitaliev euh, à mes côtés, qui est fondateur et directeur de Equality et il se consacre depuis 2003 à la préservation et à la protection des droits humains sur Internet. Donc, pour écouter cette conférence, vous devez absolument avoir euh, ce petit device, le device carré avec vos écouteurs. Donc, il y en a à la table juste derrière vous si vous avez besoin. Donc, euh, merci de votre présence et bonne écoute. OK. Bonjour tout le monde. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dimitri. I will talk in English. Um, please feel free to come a bit forward because I don't see many people. Uh, and sit down over here if you like. And yes, you need to be switched on to the correct channel. Uh, with the correct headset. All right, I just want to see uh, a show of hands of who is uh, listening in on the English channel and who is listening to the French translation. Okay, so I'll speak a little bit faster. And uh, just wanted to thank the translators who have been uh, incredibly busy doing an incredibly difficult job somewhere at the back. I don't know where, but thank you. All right, so this presentation is about keeping Ukraine connected. I just want to start off with a question. If anybody knows what the actual blue and yellow flag uh, of Ukraine represents. Is anybody aware? Okay, well, the blue um, represents the sky and the yellow represents the grain. The blue, unfortunately, is full of uh, Russian cruise missiles at the moment and warplanes. The grain, as I'm sure you all know, is stuck in Ukrainian ports and not being able to feed the rest of the world. So this is kind of the situation where we're in. And uh, this is where my presentation starts. So I run an own digital security organization based out of here in Montreal called Equality. We develop cybersecurity solutions and services Um, in order to protect privacy, freedom of expression, and association on the internet. Um, as you might have noticed from my name, I come from the region as well. I am uh, half Russian, half Ukrainian, and uh, quite a lot of my team hails from this region as well. Um, when the second conflict began, I think we really did a lot of work to reorientate our programming, our focus on this region, and particularly on the defense of uh, Ukrainian territories and Ukrainian people. Now, we brought several of our existing technologies to the fore in Ukraine. One of these uh, is called Deflect. It is a website security platform. It's protecting websites from various forms of cyber attack. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Also, the Sino browser. This is a web browser we have developed, uh, which allows people to access the web without restriction in many countries around the world, and now also in certain parts of Ukraine, the internet is censored. And we're going to talk a little bit about internet censorship in Ukraine and uh, what it is that equality is doing to help people access the internet without restrictions. Also another project we did um, a few years after the first invasion of Crimea, if you might recall that was in 2014, is that we stood up a digital security school working with uh, local journalists and civil society activists, teaching them the basic principles of information security. My company, yeah, as you probably get by now, works on web security, on censorship resistance, and on capacity building. Two projects that we introduced as a result of this invasion, a post-invasion, Uh, have been the DCOMS project, which I will touch upon later, and the Nidino helpline. So this is a digital security helpline, which is going to be serving the entire country, population from the entire country, uh, launching next week in Kiev. If you happen to be there next week, uh, come see me afterwards, and I'll, I'll introduce you to it, and hopefully see you there. Uh, the projects that we're doing, of course, on the ground are being done together with a local partner, Internews Ukraine, and a lot of this work is being funded by your tax dollars, if you're paying taxes in Canada, uh, by 
uh, the Global Affairs Canada. So also thank you for paying the taxes. So the National Security Helpline is coming to the problem from the point of view that this is not a great time for people to read lots of manuals, to go through all sorts of complicated webinars. People are in psychological and in physical stress. They have questions, they can't log into their email addresses, something is broken. They just need answers. So the helpline um, that is already standing up and is being launched next week is there to serve these answers. Uh, requests can come in by email, via web chat, via telegram and WhatsApp and Signal is a popular messenger there. And are processed by a number of volunteers and um, hired operators um, to make sure that you know, people get the advice that they need. The more frequent advices end up on the website in a sort of a database of questions and answers. Now, with Deflect, we've been protecting quite a large number of Ukrainian websites. Um, this is our total traffic bar from around the world. Uh, the color at the top, as you can see, is Ukraine. So citizens from Ukraine have been our biggest audience since the beginning of the war. Deflect offers website security, secure hosting, uh, we also look at the attacks being launched against our clients, investigate them sometimes in order to expose the malicious infrastructure or maybe even the provenance of the attack, who is trying to bring down these websites. Deflect is also a commercial service and you can come talk to us, find us in the exhibitors uh, conference hall. Uh, we'll be happy to tell you more about this service as well. Just in the last few days, uh, I'm bringing you statistics from a large attack against uh, Zhitomir Info. This is a news media in the town of Zhitomir in Ukraine. Uh, three large attacks were recorded, were mitigated by the deflect infrastructure. As you can see, over 33 million malicious requests were made by botnets, counting over 100,000 members, or bots, really. Um, so quite large attacks we are seeing and mitigating uh, every day against Ukrainian websites. You've probably read in the news, you know, this war isn't only being fought on the battlefield. There is also quite a large information warfare going on on both sides. Since June, 50 new websites, Ukrainian websites, came on board. Uh, one of those uh, websites is the current Nobel Prize winner. Peace Prize winner. I think uh, we're working with two out of the three Nobel Peace Prize winners of this year. They're behind the deflect system. Over 400,000 daily unique readers in Ukraine, unique Ukrainians, you could say, uh, are reading websites protected by the deflect system. And so far to date, we've recorded almost two dozen significant attacks against these websites. Now, what you see in front of you is uh, maybe a slightly historic, but possibly a future map of the network in Ukraine uh, with uh, Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. You can see the sort of large connection points, not only inside Ukraine, but the way that Ukraine is connected to other exchanges around the world. In other words, the way it is connected to the global internet. One important addendum, I have to say, is that both Crimea and the currently occupied territories of Ukraine are now being routed inside the Russian internet. So people living in Kherson, in Donetsk, in Luhansk, are actually finding themselves in the Runet, on the Russian internet, and hence also behind all the various surveillance and censorship that users living in the Russian internet are faced with every day. In expectation of this conflict, you know, we knew that there's going to be major internet outage and internet censorship events. You might have also heard, you know, this new kind of um, uh, scenario of internet shutdowns. Uh, so what does it mean? There are two kind of primary scenarios of internet shutdowns I would like to talk to you about and to show you the solutions that we have for those types of shutdowns. So the first and I guess the most popular scenario, i.e. the one that is implemented most often around the world, is 
the restriction of access to all of the most popular and requested internet platforms. So if you want to cut off the internet in your region, it is more or less efficient you know, to cut off access to Akamai, to AWS, to the Google Cloud, to the Microsoft Cloud, and as well cut off access to all the VPN services out there so people cannot go around these blocks. When you've done this, you have virtually shut off the internet for the population living in this network. Why? Because most of us are using resources on these popular cloud platforms. For this particular scenario, we have developed uh, the Sino tool. Sino is a browser. You download it like Chrome or Firefox. It is actually built on top of Firefox. And it works on your phone just like a normal browser. However, under the hood, it's not a normal browser at all. Sino uses the BitTorrent protocol in order to route people's requests for web pages and to deliver these requests back to them. Now, what is quite interesting when you're beginning to use BitTorrent, BitTorrent, for those who don't know, is a file sharing protocol, is that you are not limited by the same censorship restrictions as were effective before. You are actually using other people's devices who are also running the Sino browser to route your request outside of the censored zone. Then, once you get outside of the censored zone, you reach one of our injectors, which requests the web page that you've requested, that you've asked for, turns this web page and various web assets into different files, and delivers these files back to you using the peer-to-peer -peer BitTorrent protocol. Now, what this means as well is that we don't have any sort of centralized VPN services or proxies that users need to reach. There are no, there's no particular infrastructure that is being run by my company, which the sensor can also block. Every person becomes a node for everybody else. So if you want to help out people living in censored environments, all you need to do is download and run the Sino browser on your phone as well via your phone's unfettered connection to the internet, people living in censored zones can get out and get the information that they've been requested. So we call this cooperative browsing. That's why Sino's slogan is share the web. But even more than this, by virtue of the BitTorrent peer-to-peer -peer protocol, once you have downloaded a particular web page, the next person requesting the same page can get it from you. Much as we used to do, you know, with uh, music sharing and film sharing before the age of streaming. When the internet is cut completely, content that remains inside this network is still available to everybody else using the standard web address. So we benefit from the elements of decentralized caching here. This is the Sino browser. There's also a more severe shutdown scenario when a network is completely isolated. In a wartime scenario, this can happen quite frequently simply by severing the cable that connects one city to the rest of the network. We have seen this take place already several times uh, in several locations in Ukraine. So after this, there is no way to route outside of the network. The network is physically disconnected from the rest of the internet. Solutions to this kind of problem also have to be kind of novel. What can you do? Well, since before, you know, we were all trying to get to the Facebooks or to the Google servers. You know, this is Internet 2.0, the Internet of Social Media. Now, you probably heard Internet 3.0 is coming, the decentralized Internet. The decentralized Internet means there is no Google server, there is no Microsoft server. We are all servers to each other, and all we need to do is connect to each other. Now, this actually opens up the opportunities to continue communications within restricted or severed networks. 
Email, for example, is an old protocol that actually uses still these decentralized properties. We also have chat tools using decentralization. For example, Matrix. We have social media tools using decentralized communications. For example, Mastodon or Diaspora. Equality also develops technology based on decentralization. And it is this technology that allows people living inside an isolated network to continue communicating with each other. So with this in mind, in the middle of March, quite quickly, we launched a, pro a project called DCOMS, whose purpose is to basically collate existing decentralized communication tools, set up as many servers in various geographic locations as possible, on the premise that if this city or if this town is disconnected from the internet, people living in this town can still communicate with each other which is, I think, one of the central tenets, promises, you know, of, of the internet from the get-go, that people are able to communicate with each other. So there's no reason why somebody living in Kherson who wants to chat to somebody else in the next block, you know, needs to reach a WhatsApp server or needs to reach a Telegram server. They just need to be able to reach their local ISP where our servers are provisioned and they can chat with each other without necessarily losing any of the uh, privacy uh, and um, authenticity properties. So the DCOMS network is currently in uh, 10 cities around Ukraine and we're always looking for new ISPs to continue uh, provisioning more servers. Something I didn't mention, I should mention perhaps uh, now and from the start is that all technology that my organization develops is released free and open source and we encourage others to pick it up, to reproduce it, to build on top of it as well. Now, coming back to Sino a little bit. So Sino was the browser. Now, and underneath this browser is this complicated peer-to-peer -peer BitTorrent network. I'm not gonna spend too much time explaining how it works, but from the picture, I guess you can get an idea that it's complicated. But it works. Now, using this technology, this decentralized technology, we can, as I mentioned before, allow content to continue propagating inside the country. But that is not enough, because particularly in a time of war, what you want to do is get new information to the population living inside an isolated network. We're adding new technology that will package entire websites. So it will crawl an entire media website, package it, and then deliver it into the severed network. How do we deliver it? Well, satellite is one obvious technology. Um, Starlink has had some propagation in Ukraine, has helped out a lot. Um, but there are other technologies which don't expose the user's location as much as Starlink does and are not necessarily dependent on the whims of the CEO. And uh, we're looking into this. We're looking into using satellite TV broadcasts. On satellite TV, you can also include a data channel in order to populate a severed network with the contents of a particular news media or with the contents of a particular humanitarian organization. Once we can inject this packet, the WeNet network that I showed you before can propagate it. So I guess in response and as a result of the war in Ukraine, we have developed technology that allows us to rebuild pieces of the internet inside seven networks. And if you're interested to know more about this, or if you're interested to even collaborate, please come and see me after this talk. Come by our booth uh, at the Exhibitor Center. So finally, um, if you are motivated to help keeping Ukrainians online, obviously, as I mentioned already, paying taxes already does uh, part of the job. A more direct way to help would be to contribute to the Global NOG Alliance. This is a collection of uh, telco engineers, uh, 
who are currently fundraising for equipment to replace damaged cables, damaged servers and routers in Ukraine. So if you scan this uh, QR code, you can go to their donation page. And um, we've seen their work, you know, they're really are serious about it and have already contributed to the restoration of uh, many local networks. These are the URLs of the projects I've mentioned and this presentation you can download from our website equalit.ie slash fig22. Um, I welcome your questions if you have any. Thank you. If you, if you do have questions, uh, please stand up to the mic here and, uh, and pose them. Hello? Yeah. Uh, how many cities do you have for this DECOM project in Ukraine? And are they currently under Russian occupation? Thank you. So yeah, at the moment uh, we have service provisioned in 10 different cities. Two of these are under Russian occupation. One of them, particularly the server in Kherson, you might have uh, read about Kherson quite often. We continuously lose access to it because we're not in Kherson, but that is actually how this network was developed. We're meant to lose access to the Kherson server if Kherson loses connection to the rest of the internet. But the uh, the principle of this project is that people still in Kherson can continue to reach it, can continue to communicate with each other. Hello. I mean, I'm just going to speak in English, but um, so, like, is this like a meta server? Is it running like a bunch of Mastodon instances or something? Um, or is it like a custom social media thing that you've made? Like, like a, I'm, I mean, I have many, many questions, but you can just sort of fill in as man many details as you feel like telling us about DCOMs. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's really just a collection of existing tools. So it's running a, a Matrix server, it's running a Mastodon server, uh, it's running a Delta chat server, which allows people to message each other using the SMTP protocol. It has offline downloads for the Sino browser and for a few other kind of offline first technologies. So yeah, we didn't really develop anything apart from the interface, the provisioning system, uh, everything is dockerized and uh, on GitHub. Okay, thanks again and come see us at the Exhibitor Center. Bye-bye.